the preface to satan's diary this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by carolyn satan's diary by leonid andreyev translated by hermann bernstein the preface by hermann bernstein satan's diary leonid andreyev's last work was completed by the great russian in a few days before he died in finland in september nineteen nineteen but a few years ago the most popular and successful of russian writers andreyev died almost penniless a sad tragic figure disillusioned broken-hearted over the tragedy of russia a year ago leonid andreyev wrote me that he was eager to come to america to study this country and familiarize americans with the fate of his unfortunate countrymen i arranged for his visit to this country and informed him of this by cable but on the very day i sent my cable the sad news came from finland announcing that leonid andreyev died of heart failure in satan's diary andreyev summoned up his boundless disillusionment in an absorbing satire on human life fearlessly and mercilessly he hurled the falsehoods and hypocrisies into the face of life he portrayed satan coming to this earth to amuse himself and play having assumed the form of an american multimillionaire satan set out on a tour through europe in quest of amusement and adventure before him passed various forms of spurious virtues hypocrisies the ruthless cruelty of man and the often deceptive innocence of woman within a short time satan finds himself outwitted deceived relieved of his millions mocked humiliated beaten by man in his own devilish devices the story of andreyev's beginning as a writer is best told in his autobiography which he gave me in nineteen o eight i was born he said in oriol in eighteen seventy one and studied there at the gymnasium i studied poorly while in the seventh class i was for a whole year known as the worst student and my mark for conduct was never higher than four sometimes three the most pleasant time i spent at school which i recall to this day with pleasure was recess time between lessons and also the rare occasions when i was sent out from the classroom the sunbeams the free sunbeams which penetrated some cleft and which played with the dust in the hallway all this was so mysterious so interesting so full of a peculiar hidden meaning when i studied at the gymnasium my father an engineer died as a university student i was in dire need during my first course in st petersburg i even starved not so much out of real necessity as because of my youth inexperience and my inability to utilize the unnecessary parts of my costume i am to this day ashamed to think that i went two days without food at a time when i had two or three pairs of trousers and two overcoats which i could have sold it was then that i wrote my first story about a starving student i cried when i wrote it and the editor who returned my manuscript laughed that story of mine remained unpublished in eighteen ninety four in january i made an unsuccessful attempt to kill myself by shooting as a result of this unsuccessful attempt i was forced by the authorities into religious penitence and i contracted heart trouble though not of a serious nature yet very annoying during this time i made one or two unsuccessful attempts at writing 
i devoted myself with greater pleasure and success to painting which i loved from childhood on i made portraits to order at three and five roubles apiece in eighteen ninety seven i received my diploma and became an assistant attorney but i was at the very outset sidetracked i was offered a position on the courier for which i was to report court proceedings i did not succeed in getting any practice as a lawyer i had only one case and lost it at every point in eighteen ninety eight i wrote my first story for the eastern number and since that time i have devoted myself exclusively to literature maxim gorky helped me considerably in my literary work by his always practical advice and suggestions andreyev's first steps in literature his first short stories attracted but little attention at the time of their appearance it was only when countess tolstoy the wife of leo tolstoy in a letter to the novoye vremya came out in defence of artistic purity and moral power in contemporary literature declaring that russian society instead of buying reading and making famous the works of the andreyevs should rise against such filth with indignation that almost everybody who knew how to read in russia turned to the little volume of the young writer in her attack upon andreyev countess tolstoy said as follows the poor new writers like andreyev succeeded only in concentrating their attention on the filthy point of human degradation and uttered a cry to the undeveloped half-intelligent reading public inviting them to see and to examine the decomposed corpse of human degradation and to close their eyes to god's wonderful vast world with the majesty of art with the lofty yearnings of the human soul with the religious and moral struggles and the great ideals of goodness even with the downfall misfortunes and weaknesses of such people as dostoevsky depicted in describing all these every true artist should illumine clearly before humanity not the side of filth and vice but should struggle against them by illumining the highest ideals of good truth and the triumph over evil weakness and the vices of mankind i should like to cry out loudly to the whole world in order to help those unfortunate people whose wings given to each of them for high flights towards the understanding of the spiritual light beauty kindness and god are clipped by these andreyevs this letter of countess tolstoy called forth a storm of protest in the russian press and strange to say the representatives of the fair sex were among the warmest defenders of the young author answering the attack many women in their letters to the press pointed out that the author of anna karenina had been abused in almost the same manner for his kreutzer sonata and that tolstoy himself had been accused of exerting just such an influence as the countess attributed to andreyev over the youth of russia since the publication of countess tolstoy's condemnation andreyev has produced a series of masterpieces such as the life of father vasily a powerful psychological study red laughter a war story written with the blood of russia the life of man a striking morality presentation in five acts anathema his greatest drama and the seven who were hanged in which the horrors of russian life under the tsar were delineated with such beautiful simplicity and power that turgenev or tolstoy himself would have signed his name to this masterpiece thus the first accusations against andreyev were disarmed by his artistic productions permeated with sincere 
profound love for all that is pure in life dostoevsky and maupassant depicted more subjects such as that treated in the abyss than andreyev but with them these stories are lost in the great mass of their other works while in andreyev who at that time had as yet produced but a few short stories works like the abyss stood out in bold relief i recall my first meeting with leonid andreyev in nineteen o eight two weeks after my visit to count leo tolstoy at yasnaya polyana at that time he had already become the most popular russian writer his popularity having overshadowed even that of maxim gorky as i drove from terioki to andreyev's house along the dust-covered road the stern and taciturn little finnish driver suddenly broke the silence by saying to me in broken russian andreyev is a good writer although he is a russian he is a very good man he is building a beautiful house here in finland and he gives employment to many of our people we were soon at the gate of andreyev's beautiful villa a fantastic structure weird-looking original in design something like the conception of the architect in the life of man my son is out rowing with his wife in the gulf of finland andreyev's mother told me they will be back in half an hour as i waited i watched the seething activity everywhere on andreyev's estate in yasnaya polyana the home of count tolstoy everything seemed long established fixed well regulated serenely beautiful andreyev's estate was astir with vigorous life young strong men were building the house of man more than thirty of them were working on the roof and in the yard and a little distance away in the meadows young women and girls bright-eyed and red-faced were haying youth strength vigour everywhere and above all the ringing laughter of little children at play i could see from the window the black little river which sparkled in the sun hundreds of feet below the constant noise of the workmen's axes and hammers was so loud that i did not notice when leonid andreyev entered the room where i was waiting for him pardon my manner of dressing he said as we shook hands in the summer i lead a lazy life and do not write a line i am afraid i am forgetting even to sign my name i had seen numerous photographs of leonid andreyev but he did not look like any of them instead of a pale-faced sickly-looking young man there stood before me a strong handsome well-built man with wonderful eyes he wore a greyish blouse black wide pantaloons up to his knees and no shoes or stockings we soon spoke of russian literature at the time particularly of the drama we have no real drama in russia said andreyev russia has not yet produced anything that could justly be called a great drama perhaps the storm by ostrovsky is the only russian play that may be classed as a drama tolstoy's plays cannot be placed in this category of the later writers anton chekhov came nearest to giving real dramas to russia but unfortunately he was taken from us in the prime of his life what do you consider your own life of man and to the stars i asked they are not dramas they are merely presentations in so many acts answered andreyev and after some hesitation added i have not written any dramas but it is possible that i will write one at this point andreyev's wife came in dressed in a russian blouse the conversation turned to america and to the treatment accorded to maxim gorky in new york when i was a child i loved america 
remarked andreyev perhaps cooper and main reed my favourite authors in my childhood days were responsible for this i was always planning to run away to america i am anxious even now to visit america but i am afraid i may get as bad a reception as my friend gorky got he laughed as he glanced at his wife after a brief pause he said the most remarkable thing about the gorky incident is that while in his stories and articles about america gorky wrote nothing but the very worst that could be said about that country he never told me anything but the very best about america some day he will probably describe his impressions of america as he related them to me it was a very warm day the sun was burning mercilessly in the large room madame andreyev suggested that it would be more pleasant to go down to a shady place near the black little river on the way down the hill andreyev inquired about tolstoy's health and was eager to know his views on contemporary matters if tolstoy were young now he would have been with us he said we stepped into a boat madame andreyev took up the oars and began to row we resumed our conversation the decadent movement in russian literature said andreyev started to make itself felt about ten or fifteen years ago at first it was looked upon as mere child's play as a curiosity now it is regarded more seriously although i do not belong to that school i do not consider it worthless the fault with it is that it has but few talented people in its ranks and these few direct the criticism of the decadent school they are the writers and also the critics and they praise whatever they write of the younger men alexander bloch is perhaps the most gifted but in russia our clothes change quickly nowadays and it is hard to tell what the future will tell us in our literature and our life how do i picture to myself this future continued andreyev in answer to a question of mine i cannot know even the fate and future of my own child how can i foretell the future of such a great country as russia but i believe that the russian people have a great future before them in life and in literature for they are a great people rich in talents kind and freedom-loving savage as yet it is true very ignorant but on the whole they do not differ so much from other european nations suddenly the author of red laughter looked upon me intently and asked how is it that the european and the american press has ceased to interest itself in our struggle for emancipation is it possible that the reaction in russia appeals to them more than our people's yearnings for freedom simply because the reaction happens to be stronger at the present time in that event they are probably sympathizing with the shah of persia russia to-day is a lunatic asylum the people who are hanged are not the people who should be hanged everywhere else honest people are at large and only criminals are in prison in russia the honest people are in prison and the criminals are at large the russian government is composed of a band of criminals and nicholas the second is not the greatest of them there are still greater ones i do not hold that the russian government alone is guilty of these horrors the european nations and the americans are just as much to blame for they look on in silence while the most despicable crimes are committed the murderer usually has at least courage while he who looks on silently when murder is committed is a contemptible weakling england and france who have become so friendly to our government are surely watching with compassion the poor shah who hangs the constitutional leaders perhaps i do not know international law perhaps i am not speaking as a practical man 
one nation must not interfere with the internal affairs of another nation but why do they interfere with our movement for freedom france helped the russian government in its war against the people by giving money to russia germany also helped secretly in well-regulated countries each individual must behave decently when a man murders robs dishonours women he is thrown into prison but when the russian government is murdering helpless men and women and children the other governments look on indifferently and yet they speak of god if this had happened in the middle ages a crusade would have been started by civilized peoples who would have marched to russia to free the women and the children from the claws of the government andreyev became silent his wife kept rowing for some time slowly without saying a word we soon reached the shore and returned silently to the house that was twelve years ago i met him several times after that the last time i visited him in petrograd during the july riots in nineteen seventeen a literary friend thus describes the funeral of leonid andreyev which gives a picture of the tragedy of russia in the morning a decision had to be reached as to the day of the funeral it was necessary to see to the purchase and the delivery of the coffin from viborg and to undertake all those unavoidable hard duties which are so painful to the family it appeared that the russian exiles living in our village had no permits from the finnish government to go to viborg nor the money for that expense it further appeared that the family of leonid andreyev had left at their disposal only one hundred marks about six dollars which the doctor who had come from the station after andreyev's death declined to take from the widow for his visit this was all the family possessed it was necessary to charge a russian exile living in a neighbouring village who had a pass for viborg with the sad commission of finding among some wealthy people in viborg who had known andreyev the means required for the funeral on the following day mass was read floral tributes and wreaths from viborg with black inscriptions made hastily in ink on white ribbons began to arrive they were all from private individuals the local refugees brought garlands of autumn foliage bouquets of late flowers their children laid their carefully woven simple and touching little childish wreaths at the foot of the coffin leonid andreyev's widow did not wish to inter the body in foreign soil and it was decided temporarily until burial in native ground to leave his body in the little mortuary in the park on the estate of a local woman landowner the day of the funeral was not widely known the need for special permits to travel deprived many of the opportunity to attend in this way it happened that only a very small group of people followed the body from the house to the mortuary none of his close friends was there they like his brothers sister one of his sons were in russia neighbours refugees acquaintances of the last two years with whom his exile had accidentally thrown him into contact people who had no connection with russian literature almost all alien in spirit such was the little group of russians that followed the coffin of leonid andreyev to its temporary resting-place it was a tragic funeral this funeral in exile of a writer who is so dearly loved by the whole intellectual class of russia whom the younger generation of russia acclaimed with such enthusiasm meanwhile he rests in a foreign land waiting waiting for free russia to demand back his ashes 
and pay tribute to his genius among his last notes breathing deep anguish and despair found on his desk were the following lines revolution is just as unsatisfactory a means of settling disputes as is war if it be impossible to vanquish a hostile idea except by smashing the skull in which it is contained if it be impossible to appease a hostile heart except by piercing it with a bayonet then of course fight leonid andreyev died of a broken heart but the spirit of his genius is deathless hermann bernstein new york september end of the preface